Hey guys, can you see me? I started a little early. We have a Mohammedan. Mark G, where are you, sir? We're waiting. How you doing, guys? Yeah. I started a couple of minutes early to see how long this debate will last with Mark G. Okay, everything good? Pray for the internet connectivity. Yeah, because we have a Muhammad in here who thinks he can defend Muhammad. Yep. So I'm gonna it's gonna take less than 10 minutes. Watch, guys. I'm more of a prophet than his prophet. Bill Thompson, what exactly are you asking about the names? <clears throat> Maybe I can answer now because I'm waiting for Mark G. I just told him, come on, I'm waiting for him. Yeah. What's up, Bill Thompson? What exactly do you want to know about the divine names? You mentioned the Tetragrammaton, Yahovah. Exactly, Andrew Martin. You and I both are more of a prophet than Muhammad. He was a prophet, P-R-O-F-I-T. Yeah, I hope this guy shows up in time. Okay, guys, if you want to ask me questions now, because I want to start officially in 14 minutes, but I start it now. Yeah, when you say history and distinction between the different names, you have to be even more specific than that, because the word Adonai, Hey, 1611, were you here for the entire session yesterday, brother? Because it looked like you disappeared. The word Adonai is in the Hebrew Bible. The Tetragrammaton is in the Hebrew Bible. For those of you who don't know what the Tetragrammaton is, Tetra means four, Grammaton means letters, the four letters. And that's the technical term referring to the divine name. Okay, In Hebrew, the Old Testament <clears throat> originally had no vowel markings, right? It's a consonantal text. So there were no vowel markings. The vowel markings, all right. No, Mark G, you're not going to get away with it. You're going to debate what I want you to debate. You just said the Trinity is a joke. We're going to show your prophet is a joke and that his God is Satan. So are you ready, Mark G? You see these cowards? They want to attack the Bible. You can't because your wicked prophet thought the Bible is the uncorrupt word of God. So Mark G, are you ready to answer questions? Guys, time for the barbecue. Yes, I do, Charlie Saba. But hold on. Mark G, are you ready to answer my first question? Let's see if you're not ashamed of your prophet, even though I'm ashamed of your prophet for you. Put a one if you're ready, Mark G, because you're going to give us an opportunity to expose Muhammad for the son of Satan that he was. Why well, ask why? Just drink Bud Dry. Yeah, I'm on tonight, a little later than normal, because I won't be able to be on for a while. Oh, yeah, choose Jesus. He was a pedophile. Islam is the religion of pedophilia. Okay, notice his language. Guys, I want you to save this uh, screenshot because he's a filthy dog like Muhammad. He just said, your Bible's corrupt, you little. And he just, <clears throat> he just called me by one of Allah's names. You guys see it? Save that. I want you guys to take a screenshot. Mark G., just exemplified the spirit of his dog, Muhammad, because he just called me one of Allah's names. He called me a B.I.H. That's one of the 90 name, 99 names of Allah. <laughs> so instead of now reciting the names of Allah, are you ready to answer the question? Because we're going to see who the female dog is. Are you ready? Or are you going to just start manifesting like your prophet did and start foaming at the mouth? Guys, then I tell you it won't take long. So is that all you're going to see? You're going to start just foaming at the mouth like your prophet used to because he was demon-possessed? So why did you recite one of the names of Allah? Are you going to waste our time? Let us know. Are you ready to answer the question? Charlie Saba, you want me to block you? Okay, Charlie Saba, you got to go. Hold on. I got to send this guy in his merry way. Sorry. He comes to my discussion with this Muslim and he chimes in. Bye-bye, Charlie Saba. Don't come back. Okay. Mark G, are you ready for the question? Final chance before you get blocked. Are you ready? See, I told you guys, waste the time. Waste of time. 
Okay, <clears throat> Mark G. I want you to quote a single verse in the Quran where it says Gabriel is the Holy Spirit. That's the first question. Quote a single verse in the Quran where it says Gabriel is the Holy Spirit. Yeah, because remember, these jihadis, they work in packs like a pack of rabi dogs. So that's the us. And he's speaking like Allah. Remember, he just recited one of the names of Allah, B.I.H. Right? Guys, ignore him. Let me deal with him. Allah and Mark G <clears throat> always travel like a pack of dogs. Quote a single verse, Mark G, quote a single verse that says, Gabriel, Jibreel is the Holy Spirit. I just gave you the question. What a waste of the dog, man. It's an insult to even call him a dog. You're wasting our time here. Guys, can you stay out of it? Let me deal with him and stop engaging him. You guys can't control yourselves. Let me deal with this guy. Okay. <clears throat> How many guys want to bet he won't make it past 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock? He can hear. He heard me. Hey, Scott, what's up, brother? I couldn't pick up the phone, Scott, because I was busy. Sorry about that. We're wasting time with this guy anyway. Sorry about that. Okay. Mark G., can you show me a verse where it says, Gabriel is the Holy Spirit? And this shows that you're an ignoramus when it comes to the longer ending of Mark. Can you answer the question and pretend you're not a rabid dog? Stop trying to imitate your prophet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me make it easy for you. Mark G. Let me give you another question. Can you, can you quote a single verse in the Quran that tells us how many chapters make up the Quran and how many verses <clears throat> make up each chapter of the Quran? Guys, can you hear my, my question? Mark G, since you're talking about the Bible, I'm going to show that your Quran is nothing, <clears throat> is nothing but Arabic toilet paper. Okay. Can you show me a single verse in the Quran that tells us how many chapters make up the Quran and how many verses make up each chapter? Thank you. The Quran is nothing but Arabic toilet paper. I don't mean insult toilet paper. Okay, Mark G, quote a single verse that tells us the Quran, how many chapters make up the Quran and how many verses make up each surah. We're waiting, Mark G. You're wasting our time. Okay, see, now I'm going to play your game. Mark G. Can you show me in your Quran where Jesus says, I am the Messiah? Can you show me in your Quran where Jesus says, I am the word of Allah, which he cast down to Mary? Can you show me in your Quran where Jesus says, I am a spirit from him? We're waiting, Margie. These are three questions, and I just buried your prophet further into hell, and you're not helping your prophet. Okay, Mark G., can you show me where your Quran, in your Quran, Jesus says, I am the Messiah? Can you show me in your Quran where Jesus says, I am the word of Allah that he cast down to Mary? Can you show me in your Quran where Jesus says, I am a spirit from him? And can you show me where Muhammad says, I am a prophet of Allah? Can you show me where Muhammad says in the Quran, I'm a prophet of Allah? These are now three questions I asked you, but like your prophet, all you can do is murder people, rape their women, and take them captive. And what was that about being a B.I.H.? Final chance, Mark G., Okay, you see he's a dog, right? He makes Muhammad look decent. Okay, thank you. Didn't I tell you he's not going to make it past nine? This is what we do to dogs. We muzzle them. Bye-bye, dog. Go back to smooching the black stone. Smoochy, smoochy. Okay. Didn't I tell you? See, now Mark, Andrew and I are more of a prophet than Muhammad because we prophesied he wouldn't do it, right? 
Yeah, but they want exact words, Andrew. And you see what I did to him, right? I said, okay, show me in the Quran where Jesus says, I am the Messiah. Show me the Quran where Jesus says, I am the word of Allah, which he cast down to Mary. Show me the Quran where Jesus says, I am a spirit from Allah. And show me the Quran where Muhammad says, I am a prophet. You won't find in the Quran. So using their logic, Andrew Martin, since Jesus never said it, that means he can't be the Messiah. He can't be the word of Allah cast down to Mary. He can't be a spirit from Allah. And Muhammad can't be a prophet because nowhere does the Quran have them saying those things. See what I just did? <clears throat> you saw what I just did, right? Did you catch how I turned their objection against them? When they tell you, show me, Jesus said, I am God in those exact words. So, okay, if we're going to play that fallacy. Show me in your Quran. We don't believe Jesus speaks in your Quran. Show me Jesus in the in these exact words saying, I am the Messiah. Oh, you can't find it. You didn't say it. Show me in the Quran where Jesus says, I am the word of Allah, which he cast down to Mary. Can't find it. Never said it. And even if he did, that's not the words of Jesus. But for argument's sake, show me where Jesus says, I'm a spirit from Allah, a spirit from him. Can't find it. Never said it. Show me in the Quran where Muhammad says, I am a prophet of Allah. Can't find it. Never said it. So using this argument, you just buried Muhammad in hell. And you just proved the Quran is wrong for saying that Jesus is the Messiah, the word of Allah, which he cast down to Mary and a spirit from him because Jesus never said in the Quran. Hey, can you send this guy? Hey, buddy, you're a disgrace to the Greek church and you're a disgrace to Christianity. And you two are an agent of Satan and you're getting out of here. Block this, this demon who comes in here and attacks the King James. Okay. He's a wicked demon and he claims to be a Christian. You're a disgrace. Guys, in time, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, this channel will only attract serious students of the Bible. People are going to learn real quick. People are going to learn real quick that the only people who will be allowed on my channel are serious students of the Bible who truly love the Bible, truly love the Trinity, and want to learn, even learn things they may disagree with, meaning certain perspectives that they may not agree with me. That's fine. Let me make it clear to everyone. Guys, let me make it clear to everyone. I don't want you to blindly follow everything I say, and I mean it from my heart. Now, guys, I need you to pay attention. Please pay attention. Please. And in Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray it's from my heart, and I mean it. I don't want you to blindly believe and follow everything, anything I say. I don't want you to make me more than I am. And I don't want cult following. Now, I don't mean to insult you. I'm not saying that you would follow me, blind me, like a cult leader. I don't want that. I don't want it. I don't want anyone to blindly follow me, make me more than I am, and accept everything I say. What I want you to do is, is simply listen to my perspective, my position, take all the verses, go back, beg the Holy Spirit, beseech the Holy Spirit to guide you, to show you if I'm right and if I'm wrong. To correct me if I'm wrong, and if you disagree, then that's fine. <clears throat> we can agree to disagree. But one thing I don't want you to do, I don't want you to come here and then debate me on why I'm wrong and you're right. Let me tell you what I do. Okay, let me tell you what I do. When I listen to people, I'll listen to Calvinists. I'll listen to Arminians. I'll listen to Roman Catholics. I listen to the Orthodox. I listen to Coptics. I listen to open theists. Whenever they say something I don't agree with because I think they may be wrong, but they may be right, but in my mind, I think they're wrong. I don't throw a sissy fit, right? I don't start attacking. I don't start challenging. I don't start ridiculing. I don't start slandering. I say, okay, I don't see it this way. I think he's wrong. But you know what? In these other areas, he makes some good points. He looks right, and I accept it. That's what you need to do. Don't throw the baby out with the bad uh, bath water. And as this old adage goes, chew the meat and spit out the bones. I can actually listen to anyone, even a Jehovah Witness and a Muslim, and learn from them and separate the wheat from the chaff, right? The only time I'll speak out is when it's blatant, damnable heresy. The only time I will speak out is where I feel it's blatant, damnable heresy blatant, damnable heresy. Then I'll speak out by the grace of the trying God, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? 
And the only time I'll speak out besides that is if you have someone who's an arrogant, nasty, ungracious jerk who arrogantly, ungraciously attacks other Christians for simply not doing apologetics like him or believing the same view of God's sovereignty like him or having a different understanding of salvation like him, then those arrogant, ungracious jerks who think they're bullies, well, by the grace of God, I'm a bully destroyer. You with me there? Now, uh, KJ 1611, I want you to hear what this sister and the Lord Jesus Christ from the Orthodox Church, okay, just stated. 1611, go back and read what Nada said. She's our sister and the Lord Jesus from the Orthodox Church. She goes, Shemunian, Sam, as an Orthodox Christian, I can confirm that our priests consider the King James Version to be a suitable English translation of the New Testament for us to read. Did you know that? Did you read that 1611? Here, our sister in the Lord Jesus Christ, she is our sister, born of the same spirit, just because she's from the Orthodox, that I don't automatically assume you're not a believer, just said that even the priests of the Orthodox Church recognize that the King James is the accurate translation of the New Testament suitable for members of the Orthodox Church to read. In fact, in the Orthodox Study Bible, guys, you can purchase the Orthodox Study Bible. Guess what version of the New Testament they use in the Orthodox Study Bible? Guess what version of the New Testament they use in the Orthodox Study Bible? New King James Version. That tells you that the Orthodox Church believe in what's known as the Byzantine text or the majority text as being superior and more accurate and preserving the original wording of the autographs. Did you know that? Because the New King James Version is based on what's known as the Byzantine text or the majority text, which formed the majority of our Greek witnesses, from which we get the received text and from which we get the King James. Now, I just want to confirm what Floyd May Mayweather said. Now, now Floyd Mayweather, I don't know if he's the boxer, I hope. Hey, man, if you're really that boxer and you love Jesus and you want to support ministry, send me a million. Because a million is like, what, a thousand to you. Anyway, he just said something. I do want to be clear. I want you to hear this. I do want to be clear. Any legitimate translation done by evangelical Christians. Here we go. Boring. Here goes Hater Wood. Look, Hater, I only got 86. You do a live stream, you and Christian Prince get about 1,000. Today, Christian Prince had 1,200. It wouldn't be a crime or sin for you to give a shout out to send your 400,000 cult followers to come and watch me live. You know, I've been carrying you on my shoulders. My back is broken for 12 years. The least you can do is send me some breadcrumbs, hater would. But anyway, any version of the Bible you read, any legitimate, any legitimate translation done by evangelical Christians of the Holy Bible will give you the same theology, the same God, the same Jesus, the same Holy Spirit, the same message of, of salvation, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, if I pick up the NIV and I read the Gospel of John, and I pick up DSV and I read the Gospel of John, and I pick up the New King James and I read the Gospel of John, I'm going to get the same Trinity, the same Father, the same Son, the same Holy Spirit. With me there? But now if you want to go beyond, if you want to go beyond simply <clears throat> the message that we're going to get the same message we're going to get the same view of God, Christ, Holy Spirit, salvation, and want to get back to the originals as close as possible. You want to try to get back to the original wording of the autographs as close as possible. Then that's then that <clears throat> is something different, and not all versions are equal. So the question is, are you okay with just getting the message? Because if you look at the new NIV, New International Version of King James, they agree about 93% of the time, 93% of the time, right? Now, they do have different translation principles. The, the NIV seeks to be not too literal and not, and not just simply a paraphrase. It tries to find the balance in between. So if you're 
okay with that, any translation you read, you're going to get the core doctrines of the Christian faith. But if you want to go beyond that, if you want to say, no, I want to get to the original wording of the autographs as much as possible, then not all versions are equal. Are you with me there? Are you with me there? Not all translations are equal. Then you're going to have to do a little investigation and studying into the family of manuscripts, right? Even though now textual criticism is experiencing somewhat of a revolution, right? A complete revamping of how they do textual criticism. Up until now, they would divide the manuscripts into certain families, like the Alexandrian family or Alexandrian text type, the Western text type, Western family, and the Byzantine or majority text, right? I don't need to bore you with that because we're going to go into the meat of the matter. So if you want more than just getting the message and you want to get as close as possible to the original wording of the autographs, then not all versions are equal. Exactly 1611. You with me there? So what do you want? Do you want to get as close to the original wording as possible? Or are you okay with the translation giving you <clears throat> the message of the Bible without necessarily worrying about whether their choice of readings are necessarily original or they may be mistaken in deciding this reading over this one. Well, then translations do matter, right? You get, you get my point? Is that clear? Yep, that's these girls had nothing to do with the New Testament exactly. So that's another topic for another time. That's another topic for another time. After 20 years, and again, I'm no scholar of textual criticism. I'm no scholar of the transmission of the New Testament text. But I can tell you this as well, okay? And I'm not saying this to attack. You can say I'm attacking. I'm going to call a spade a spade. I'm going to be as honest as possible. Neither is James White a scholar of the New Testament textual <clears throat> transmission, transmission of New Testament text. In fact, because he's popular, he parrots some of the egregious misinformation and errors of fact that he's picked up from other textual critics. And because people look to him as an authority and because he's more popular than, let's say, Daniel Wallace, they buy everything he says about the transmission of the New Testament text, and that's quite dangerous. Someone who's vastly superior to James White and much more reliable is James E. Snap. James E. Snap Jr. Joe One, ask me that question again, you're going to get blocked. James E. Snap Jr. James E. Snap Jr. is truly a bona fide scholar of the transmission of the New Testament text. And I thank God for him and others like him, like Jonathan Sheffield, who have done the homework and present the other side of the story that so someone like James White does not present in order to balance, balance out the misinformation that's out there. And because of their research, I have no doubt, Mark 16, verses 9 to 20, and John 7, 53 to 8, 11, are authentic and were written by Mark and John under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, James Snap is not received text only. He's not a Texas Receptus guy, and he's not King James only. He's not even majority text. He's just honest to the facts. Okay. So again, I'm going to say, stick within your own field of expertise. If God has called you to a certain field, stick with it, and don't pass yourself off as an expert in another field. Right. Let the real experts that God has raised up and anointed to address those issues. And you stick in your own lane and and do what God has called you to do and do it to the best of your ability for the glory of Christ. In other words, James White wants to be seen as a scholar of the transmission 
of the text of New Testament. And I'm going to have to be honest, he's not. He is no scholar. Neither am I, but I can tell you that. I can be honest with you. I'm not going to claim to be something I'm not. James E. Snap is. He is a scholar. And that's why I defer to him. And I thank God for him that I ran into him. And another brother, Jonathan Sheffield, thank God for that brother, for the meticulous research he did, which has now strengthened my confidence in the textual veracity and authenticity of Mark 16, verses 9 to 20, and John 7, verses 53 to 8, 11. Joe, you need to go. Send Joe on his merry way, guys. Block him. I don't want him here. Please. Thank you, guys. All right. With that said, Andrew and I are official prophets. We both prophesied that Mark, that filthy rabi dog who used a dirty slang word, the slang word for female dog, because he was reciting one of the names of Allah, wouldn't last more than five minutes. So Andrew and I were officially prophets. Now, with that said, let's begin, because Lord Jesus willing, tomorrow I'm driving. Lord Jesus willing, tomorrow I'm driving, and I won't get to my destination any sooner than Friday. I may get there Friday. I may get there Saturday. So please bathe me and my daughters in your prayers, and please ask your churches to pray for me and my daughters. And if you want to even fast for us, I'd appreciate it. I truly appreciate it for traveling mercies, for safety, for provision. For doors to open miraculously where I'm going, to continue to teach in the power of the Holy Spirit, to continue to live for Jesus, to continue to try to obey Jesus and just love Jesus and worship Jesus, right? And trust God will protect my daughters and bring them to me sooner than later in Jesus' name. <clears throat> and Lord willing, since I'll be on the road, I won't be able to do a live stream at least till the weekend, Sunday at the earliest, if God wills. So that's why I wanted to do one late night. Because I've been busy packing and running around. Okay, So please pray for me. Now, the reason why I keep asking you guys to pray for me, let me show you why. Proverbs 15, verse 8. And I'm going to begin a word of prayer. And, and interestingly, earlier today, it was the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkoth. The Festival of Tabernacles. <clears throat> Tabernacle. Right? Did you know that? Proverbs 15, verse 8. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to Jehovah, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Did you catch it? The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to Jehovah, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Do you see why I ask you guys to pray? Because I know many of you are walking in the spirit. You're clothed by the spirit. You're seeking to obey Jesus and love Jesus. So your prayers are powerful and effective and delight the heart of God. This is what I'm praying for myself, that I get to the point where I know I'm walking so closely with Jesus. I'm walking in perfect obedience or at least striving to obey him perfectly and just crucifying my flesh, flesh that when I pray, I know the Lord delights in my prayer because number one, we're covered by the blood of Jesus. Number two, we're born of the spirit. And number three, we're walking in the spirit. And the more you walk in the spirit, the more powerful your prayers become. <clears throat> And you took the words out of my mouth. I was going to actually go to James chapter 5. Let's look at it. James 5, verses 13 to 18. James 5, verses 13 to 18. Right. Amen. James 5, verses 13 to 18. What is this? Okay. Not working. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Are you happy? Let him sing psalms. Guys, these are not suggestions. They're command, com commands. Notice what the Bible commands you to do. When you're happy, sing psalms. Sing praises to God. Worship him through singing, right? Sing psalms. Sing praises to God when you're happy, right? Pay attention by the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't just want to know these things, but by his power, we're going to live them out in Jesus' name. Right? Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. <clears throat> and I'm afflicted. Pray for me. Is any sick among you? By the way, I am getting sick. My throat is very sore. I'm having a hard time swallow because of the change of weather. Pray in the almighty name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus. 
my throat is perfectly healthy tomorrow, so it won't hinder me from, from traveling. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. and Let them pray over him, anointing him with the oil in the name of the Lord. Now, according to the Bible, that oil would be olive oil. So follow these commands, brethren. These are commands for Christians even to this day and until Jesus returns. Follow these commands, right? Take olive oil, bless it in Jesus' name, and anoint the person who's sick and trust God will heal him. Now notice 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise them up. And if you have committed sins, they shall be forgiven. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another. These are not suggestions, commands by the Spirit. And in Jesus' name, we will obey these commands. Amen? Let's try to obey what we learn for the glory of Jesus. Be doers of the word. And I'm preaching to myself, right? <clears throat> Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Notice, though you may be born of the Spirit, covered by the blood of Jesus, still the result of that is obedience, bearing spiritual fruit as you strive to walk in obedience to the Spirit and deny your flesh, right? The more you do that, the more righteous you become in actuality. And the more righteous you are, the more effective your prayers become. Because God delights in the prayers of the righteous. But you cannot be righteous unless you are united to Jesus by the Spirit, born of the Spirit, and covered by the blood of Jesus. So if you are a Buddhist or a Jew or a Muslim and you are devout in prayer, your prayers are an abomination because you cannot be righteous unless you're united to Jesus. But once you're united to Jesus, born of the Spirit, covered by the blood of Jesus, then by the power of the Spirit, you become more like Christ in holiness, in obedience, and purity, less like your old self, and you crucify your flesh, and you resist your fleshly desires, and walk more in the life of the Spirit. And the more you do that by the grace of the Spirit, the more powerful your prayers become. Are you seeing it there? That's not me. This is James. Now notice the example, 17 to 18. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. He was human. He had the same passions we are. And he prayed earnest, earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Now notice 18. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. You got it? So do you see why I ask you to pray for me, ask for me and my daughters, and ask your churches to? Because I know among you, there are people who are sold out for Jesus, fasting, praying, singing, serving, visiting the sick, the those in prison, taking care of widows, loving orphans, <clears throat> denying your flesh, resisting your flesh. And you, my friend, are powerful in heaven. Your prayers get result. And I pray in Jesus' name, I become like you for the glory of Jesus, not for the praise of men. So I depend on you guys. Like God uses me to bless you with my gift, bless me if you're one of those warriors, prayer warriors, who get results in the heavenly realm because your prayers are pleasing to God. Bathe me in your prayer. Bathe my daughters in your prayer and fast for us. I need you. You're my, you're my brothers and sisters, members of the same body. You with me there? Is that clear? Making sense? Sorry about that. All right. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Father, first I ask that you forgive me and forgive my brothers and sisters for the sake of Jesus and purify us in the holy blood of Jesus. Crucify our flesh. Save us from the flesh and the stains of the flesh, Father. Not to walk in the flesh, but to walk in the life and the power of your Holy Spirit. Fill us with fruit from your Spirit. Seal us by your Spirit. Empower us by your Spirit to be disciplined, spiritually disciplined. To walk in the power and life of your Spirit, Father. And Father, I ask for this favor. Traveling mercies as I leave tomorrow. And miraculous protection of my daughters. Flood them in your love. Wash them in the blood of Jesus. Seal them by your Spirit. And flood every one of us in your love. And wash every one of us in the blood of Jesus. And fill us all and seal us all by your spirit, Father. And Father, I ask for health in Jesus' name. 
the stripes of Jesus healing me. Fill my lungs, my chest, and my throat with the breath of life and heal me, Father. So this will not hinder me from arriving to my destination by your grace and mercy. I'm blessed tonight, Father. Grant me clarity of thought and speech and save me from stammering and confusion. And bless your people, Father, to understand by the power of the Holy Spirit the things we're about to unpack for the glory of Jesus. And enable me to recall scripture and interpret it and give us the power to live it out for the glory of Jesus. Amaze us, Father, by the depth of your word. We love you. We love the Lord Jesus. We love your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yahovah Rapha. Yahovah Rapha. Yahovah Rapha. <clears throat> God bless you, Bill. You can listen to this when it's archived. Sorry it's late, but it's the only time I had. I am. That's why I got this. I'm trying to open it. It won't open. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I want to talk about Jesus as the true tabernacle of God because it's interesting that earlier today I saw Orthodox Jews in my neighborhood celebrating what's known as the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkoth, the Feast of Tabernacles, right? Did you guys know that? It was their festivity? In Jesus' name, I won't do that first and last. Yep, Sukkoth, the Feast of Tabernacles. And it's interesting because I believe the Holy Spirit laid it in my heart, the Holy Spirit put in my heart to talk about Jesus as the tabernacle of God, as another way of demonstrating that the Old Testament points to Jesus, our Lord, right? <clears throat> and lo and behold, it's the Feast of Sukkoth, the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, are you ready now to go into a little more depth, more meat, showing you how the entire Old Testament points to the Lord Jesus Christ, that even the temple, the tabernacle points to Jesus Christ, the sacrificial system points to Jesus Christ, the priesthood points to Jesus Christ, let me ask you a question. Have you ever wondered why in Leviticus 21, God makes it mandatory that a priest has to be physically without blemish? He has to be physically unblemished, right? If he has only one, and again, I'm just repeating the text, testicle or a crushed testicle or, right? He has some physical deformity. He's disqualified from being a priest. Does that mean God hates people who are physically deformed? God forbids such blasphemy. And have you ever wondered why he demands that the animals have to be unblemished, physically unblemished, physically without spot, without any blemish? You guys ever wonder why? Yes, because priests can't be spiritually unblemished. They can't be sinless. So the best they can do is be physically unblemished as a picture of the high priest, Jesus Christ, being spiritually unblemished. The animals had to be physically unblemished because they're a picture of Jesus the Lamb who is spotless, who is without blemish. Do you see how it all points to Jesus? You catch it there? Why? The physical perfection of priests and animals point to the spiritual perfection of the Lord Jesus because priests could not be spiritually unblemished. They were sinners in need of salvation. And an animal, how can you tell an animal is unblemished spiritually, morally? That's if animals are held to a moral standard. And I don't want to get into that debate. It got me in trouble last time when I talked about it. So what was required of the animal? To be physically unblemished. So the priest had to be physically unblemished, and the animals had to be physically unblemished because their physical perfection pointed to Christ, our high priest, being spiritually perfect, spiritually unblemished, spiritually without spot, as the perfect priest and sacrifice. Here, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 to 19. 1 Peter 1, verses 18 to 19. You see how it's all pointing to Jesus Christ again? All of it? Not some of it, not most of it, but all of it? Hope I'm not boring you guys. Pay attention to the language of Peter. This is the sacrificial language of the Old Testament. Pay attention. 
For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vein, from your waste of life. Vain conversation means your futile way of living, the futility of the way you used to live as you receive from your fathers, the tradition from your fathers, right? Each culture has a certain way that they speak, they dress, they act. And he says, all of that was futile. Your futile way of life, right? The Lord redeemed you from that. But now watch. How did he redeem you? Not with the corruptible things like silver and gold, because they corrupt, they erode. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Without blemish, without spot. Did you catch it? The language of the sacrificial system being applied to the Lord Jesus Christ. You guys see it or no? Before I move on, and I hope you're awake. And I'm not, sometimes I'll be entertaining, sometimes I won't. As long as you're being educated, you're seeing the depth of scripture, the beauty of scripture, and how it all points to the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9, verse 14. Hebrews 9, verse 14. Now, here I'm going to show you something beautiful about the King James. Beautiful about the King James, their translation. Hebrews 9, 14. Catch it here. Now, much more shall the blood of Christ, much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, <whistles> spotless, unblemished, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Do you see the Trinity there? Jesus Christ, the eternal spirit, and God the Father, to whom Jesus offers himself. That's a Trinitarian passage. Jesus Christ. In union with the Holy Spirit, in union with the eternal spirit, as the eternal spirit, the Holy Spirit, rested upon Christ, worked with Christ, right? In unison with Christ, offered himself to God the Father. That's the Trinity right there. You see this triadic pattern all throughout the New Testament. Triadic pattern. Pattern of three. God, Jesus, the Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But notice that the Spirit, like the Father and the Son, is eternal by nature, meaning uncreated by nature. He's always existed. Do you see it? Before I move on to the next point, man, this won't open. It's killing me. You see it? Now, according to Hebrews 9.14, the Lord Jesus offered himself through the eternal spirit. Number one, no, the spirit is not a creature. He is uncreated by nature, which is why he's called eternal. That's number one. Do you see it? Number one. So that tells you the spirit is uncreated and therefore essentially one with God and Christ. Number two, the Holy Spirit worked in union with Christ, was with Christ, Assisting Christ, working in union with Christ, in Christ accomplishing our redemption. So understand here, according to Hebrews 9, 14, it wasn't Christ alone who accomplished our redemption. It was Christ in union with the Spirit who accomplished our redemption. So the Spirit was involved in accomplishing your salvation and redemption. Do you see that before I move on? Now, here's where you're going to see the Holy Spirit clearly being de depicted as Jehovah God. Don't forget two things about the Spirit. He's eternal by nature, the eternal Spirit. That adjective, eternal, is used of the Father and the Son elsewhere. It's used of the Son specifically in 1 John chapter 1, verse 2, where the Son is said to be that eternal life that was with, with the Father and was manifest to us. The eternal life with the Father that was manifest to us. So the eternal life that was with the Father, we saw him. That's Jesus Christ. Do you see it? You see that? And then 1 John 5, 20, 1 John 5, 20, we are told that the true God is eternal life. 
The true God is eternal life. First John 5, 20. Let's unpack this. Guys, you ready for some meat? Because I don't like vegan. I'm not vegetarian. First John 5, 20. Watch here. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. Now notice what John just did. He's going to blow your mind away. Number one. According to John 17, 3, the Father is the only true God, right? Number one, according to John 17, 3, the Father is the only true God, correct? Therefore, to be the true God is to be eternal life. Notice the logic here. This is the true God and eternal life. So if you're the true God, you're eternal life. So if the Father is the true God, then he must be the eternal life, right? Now, I've already dealt with 1 John 5, 20 in depth in previous sessions. So understand, let's do this like a logical syllogism. A, or one, the true God is the eternal life. B, the Father is the only true God. C, therefore, the Father is eternal life. Okay? So notice, God the Father and the Holy Spirit are said to be eternal. And then Jesus Christ in 1 John 1, 2 is said to be the eternal life that is with the Father whom we saw. So God the Father is eternal, the Son is eternal, and the Holy Spirit is eternal. Only three who are said to be eternal. Welcome to the wonderful world of the Trinity. But now, let me show you how this proves that Jesus is the true God. 1 John 1, 2, let's read it. For the life was manifested and we have seen it. We saw the life. John, I saw the life because he became flesh and bear witness and show unto you, reveal unto you that eternal life, which was with the father. And guess what the word with the father is? Pros tan patera. Pros tan patera. An echo of John 1.1. 1, 1. And the word was with God. Pros tan theon. The eternal life, which was with the father and was manifest, manifested unto us. So here John says, Jesus is the eternal life that we saw. Hmm. Father is eternal life. Son is eternal life. The Holy Spirit is eternal. By golly, sounds like the Trinity. But over here, do you see it's the Son that's the eternal life that was with the Father? Thank you for the Greek. Okay, or I'm going to pronounce it Rasmian way. Kai e zoe. Ifani rothi. Kai ero kame. Anyway, it's going to take me too long to read it. Upon Gelomen. Umin, ten, zoen, ten, aionion. At least in pros, ton, patera, kai. Okay. Fanerothe. He mean. Okay. Anyway, pros, ton, patera. Okay. Do you guys see it? According to what you just read, Jesus Christ is the eternal life that was with the Father that was revealed. So does everyone see, according to 1 John 1, 2, Jesus is eternal life. Is that clear? Do you get it? If someone's confused, let me know. Come on, man. Christian Prince had 1,200 people watching him. I only got 82. I'm about to kill myself, bro. Come on now. This is meat, folks. We got to have over 1,000 listening to this for the glory of Jesus. Right? May God open that door for his glory. Lord, bring more for your glory. Okay, but let's go back to 1 John 5, 20. Let's unpack this. 1 John 5, 20. It's okay, brother. It's not because I want quantity, but I do want more people to receive this quality because we have a high level of biblical illiteracy, basic. And we need to cure that among Christians. Now, 1 John 5, 20. Read with me. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in the Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Now, guys, follow my logic here. Follow my logic here. To be the true God is to be eternal life. Therefore, if you are the eternal life, you're the true God, right? Can the true God and a creature be the eternal life? Can you have the true God and a creature together being the eternal life? Because 1 John 5.20 says, 
The true God is the eternal life. If you're the true God, you are eternal life. This is the true God and eternal life. Okay. Well, hold on. 1 John 1, 2 tells us Jesus is the eternal life. Therefore, if Jesus is the eternal life, he has to be the true God. Well, let's do the logic again. A, <clears throat> to be eternal life, you must be the true God. To be eternal life, you must be the true God. B, Jesus is the eternal life. C, Jesus, therefore, must be the true God. To be eternal life, you must be the true God because you cannot have the true God and a creature both being the eternal life. So to be the eternal life, you're automatically the true God. Jesus is the eternal life. Therefore, Jesus is the true God. You see how I did it with Jesus? With the Father, I said, the Father is the only true God. Yet the true God is eternal life. So if you're the true God, you're automatically the eternal life. Therefore, since the Father is the true God, he must be the eternal life. Now I reversed it. If you're eternal life, you're automatically the true God. Because you can't have the true God and a creature together being the eternal life. That's idolatry. That's blasphemy. So to be eternal life, you must be the true God. Jesus is the eternal life. Therefore, it's inarguable, inescapable. Jesus is the true God as well. And they tell me the Bible is not Trinitarian. Is that clear? So, but going back to the point, going back to the point, don't forget. Jesus, through the eternal spirit, offered himself without blemish, without spot to the Father. So, was the Holy Spirit involved in our redemption and salvation? Yes. Is the Holy Spirit eternal? Yes. And if he's eternal, doesn't that prove that he's uncreated? Because only God is eternal by nature. Although we receive everlasting life, we are not eternal by nature. But the Holy Spirit is eternal by nature, like the Father and the Son. So the Holy Spirit being said, being described as the eternal spirit, means he is God, he is uncreated, one with the Father and the Son. And the Holy Spirit was involved with Jesus, working in unison with Jesus to bring about our redemption. So who would have thunk it? The Holy Spirit was just as much involved and bringing about our redemption as the Lord Jesus. Not that he became flesh and died, but the Holy Spirit was working in union with Christ every step of the way until on the cross, where then he had to pour out the divine wrath upon the Son. Clear? But here's the beauty of the King James. Hebrews 1 verse 3. Hebrews 1, verse 3. Watch here. Hebrews 1, verse 3. Only 15 likes, huh, you sinners? Yep, he's truly, fully, eternally God. Hebrews 1, verse 3. Watch here. Catch it. Who being the brightness of his glory, the Son is the brightness of the Father's glory, and the express image of his person, and the Son upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Hold on, hold on. Here it says, Jesus by himself purged our sins. But in Hebrews 9, 14, it says, Jesus did it in union with the eternal spirit. Okay, guys, help me understand this. How can Jesus by himself purge our sins? If he did it in union with the eternal spirit, send this guy in his merry way, this wicked son of Satan. His father is the devil. How can that be? Does someone help me understand that? Hebrews 1.3 says, by himself he purged our sins. But Hebrews 9.14 says, he offered himself... Through the eternal spirit as a sacrifice to purge our sins. No, no, no. That's not what I'm asking virtual warfare. How can he have done it by himself if elsewhere it says he did it through the eternal spirit with the Holy Spirit? One what? They are one what? They're not the same person. Spirit and the Son are not the same person. They are one in essence. So it's true. Jesus by himself purged our sins, 
when you're speaking of creation. No creature assisted Jesus in purging our sins. So in reference, in relation to creation, he did it by himself. But he didn't do it alone when it comes to the Godhead because he's not the only one who is God. So you see how Hebrews 1.3 further reinforces the deity of the Holy Spirit in Hebrews 9.14. Come on, admins, you got to be quick. You catch it? Jesus, when it comes to creation, did it by himself. No creature helped him. But when it comes to the Godhead, he wasn't by himself. He did it in union with the Spirit. So as far as creation is concerned, he did it all alone. But as far as the Godhead he is concerned, he did it in union with the Spirit. So Hebrews 1.3 reinforces the fact that Hebrews 9.14 affirms that the Holy Spirit must be God and not a creature in the King James Bible. Everyone with me there? And what was the total different answer, but okay. What was it? Pedro. I'm going to give you something similar. This confirms what I said yesterday about words such as true, when the Bible says true, one and only, only, none. You have to be careful how the Bible uses such language. Right? He was by himself as far as creation is concerned, as far as human creatures or angelic creatures. But he wasn't by himself as far as the Godhead was concerned because the Holy Spirit is not part of creation. He is eternal, one with the Father and the Son in essence. Let me give you another example. Now we're going to go into Jesus being the tabernacle of God. Another example that if you don't understand what the Bible says about the deity of the Father, the deity of the Son, the deity of the Holy Spirit, there are not three gods and they're not one person, but all of them are truly God. If you don't understand that, then such language is going to baffle and confuse you because it almost seems like there are certain things said about one person of the Godhead that excludes the other members of the Godhead. Revelation 19.12, speaking of the Son, the Lord Jesus. Revelation 19.12, speaking of the Son, the Lord Jesus. Watch here. Read this. Look what it says about Jesus Christ. Look what it says about Jesus Christ. Don't let these demons, these sons of Satan, distract you. That's what they want. They're not here to learn. Rebuke them in the name of Jesus. Pay attention. Revelation 19, 12. His eyes, the eyes of the Lord Jesus, were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Now, I love the King James because it translates the Greek as no man. Actually, the Greek says no one knew. But now the King James translators understood the implication of no one. In fact, can you quote the new King James? If you don't mind, because I want to make a point here. You're going to understand my point in a minute. Tell me this filthy dog of Satan has a life. All he comes in here and just repeats the same garbage because he's filled with Satan as the rabid dog. Can you believe it? Why is he even here? It's the same guy. Okay. Protestant, try to use another translation because I want to make a point. King James captures it perfectly, but I still want to make a point. Revelation 19, 12. You're going to see where I'm going with this. It says man there? Okay. Okay, his eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. Did you catch it? Now, the Greek does say no one. That doesn't mean the King James is wrong. Actually, the King James is right. But, okay, but I just want to go with the little rendering no one. Notice here, folks, pay attention. I guess we got to send Michael Jackson to Janet Jackson because he's got to beat it. 
Beat it, beat it, because he's still upset that Billy Jean is not his lover. Okay? Revelation 19.12. One more time, post it. Because he thought this was going to be a thriller. Okay, read with me, guys. Everyone pay attention in Jesus' name. Read with me. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and his head were... And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. Okay, that's literally the Greek. No one knew. Folks, if no one knows Jesus' name except Jesus, then that means the Father and the Spirit don't know. And that means Jesus knows more than the Father and the Spirit. Did you catch it? If you take this on a literal level, Okay, you take this on a literal level. Level, no one knows the name of Jesus like Jesus. No one means everyone. So the Father and Spirit don't know. So the Son knows more than the Father and Spirit. Obviously, no one doesn't mean every single being in existence. No one here means no creature. No creature knows. This is why the King James captured it perfectly when it said no man. Because the King James realized that no one could be misunderstood to include every being. But that can't be true because the Father definitely knows the name of the Son. And the Spirit definitely knows the name of the Son. So they cannot be included in that category of no one. You caught it? Did you catch it? The Father definitely knows the name of the Son. The Spirit definitely knows the name of the Son. So when it says no one knows, it cannot include the Father and the Spirit. Because the Father and the Spirit know everything the Son knows and know everything about the Son. They're one with the Son in essence. Therefore, they are excluded by the very fact that they are God and one with the Son in essence. You see the point? So that's similar to Hebrews 1.3 where it says, Jesus by himself purged our sins. By himself in respect to creatures. No creature assisted him. But then Hebrews 9.14 says, the eternal spirit assisted him in purging our sins by offering himself as a sacrifice to God the Father. Is that making sense? The very fact that Hebrews 1.3 and the King James could say, that Jesus by himself purged our sins. But then in Hebrews 9, 14 says that Jesus through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God to purge our sins. Is proof that the spirit cannot be a creature. Otherwise you have a contradiction. Clear? So... What was the point of all this? Just like in the Old Testament, the sacrificial system and the priesthood. Priests were required to be physically without blemish. They had to be unblemished. And animals had to be physically unblemished as well. Not because God hates physically deformed animals or people. God forbid. He loves them all. Right? Or they wouldn't exist. It's because he's using their physical perfection to point to a greater truth that the high priest that these priests are a shadow of and the sacrifice that that high priest will offer, which the animals are a shadow of, that high priest is spiritually unblemished, perfect spiritually, something that the priests could not be. And that's why he required physical perfection of them, but not spiritual perfection because they could not be spiritually perfect. Is that sinking in? Are you learning? I don't know because I don't know if you're bored. I feel like I'm boring you. All right. Clear? Again, let's go to Genesis 8, 20 to 21. Genesis 8, 20 to 21. I don't know what you mean evolving sacrifice. There is no evolving sacrifice. It's pointing to a greater sacrifice, not evolving one. Genesis 8, 20, 21. Guys, read this with me. 
After the flood, Noah and his seven family members are the only survivors. After the flood, pay attention. Genesis 8, 20, 21. And Noah built an altar unto Jehovah and took of every clean beast. Notice, he had unclean animals and clean animals. So he only took clean animals, not unclean. Do you catch the picture again? Animals for sacrifice had to be clean. And every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So he built an altar and took clean animals and birds and burned them on the altar. 21. And Jehovah smelled the sweet savor. And Jehovah said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. Okay, guys, read it because I have some questions. I have some questions. Number one, Joseph, don't distract us with your nonsense. Listen, brother, please. No. Jesus did not have a body in heaven when man was created. Please do not share such stupidity. You'll get blocked. Pay attention to Genesis 8, 20, 21. Okay, pay attention, guys. Listen. Noah and his seven family members were the only human survivors after the flood, right? Correct? So then explain to me why when God smelled the aroma of the sacrifices, he said, I will no longer destroy mankind, even though the thoughts of his heart are evil from his youth. Send Joseph on his merry way. Send him to the angels so he can also be part of that body that he imagines. Okay? Who is God talking about when he says the inclinations of the thoughts of man happen to be evil from their youth when it's only Noah and his seven family members? Who's he talking about? Post Genesis 8.21 again. Genesis 8.21 again. Watch here. It's only eight human beings at this time. And Jehovah smelt a sweet Savior, and Jehovah said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite anymore every living thing as I have done. Who could God possibly be talking about that the thoughts, the inclinations of the heart of man is evil from youth, from childhood, when it's only Noah and his seven family members? Who in the world could he be possibly talking about? Someone help me. Who's he talking about, folks? Come on. Put on your thinking caps. Thank you, Al, and first and last. Not only to come. He's talking about the current situation and reality. Yep, Noah and his family. He's talking first and foremost about Noah and his family. This shows one thing. No, this is after the flood, 1611. That was in Genesis 6. This is afterwards. This shows one thing. That even Noah and his family were sinners whom if God were to hold them accountable for their sins, they too would be destroyed, proving God didn't save Noah or, or his family because they were righteous. He saved them because of his mercy and grace. So here you have proof. Noah and his family were not saved. Because they were righteous. Because God just said that even them, the inclinations of their thoughts, are evil from youth unless God's grace covers them and changes them, proving Noah wasn't saved because of his righteousness. He was saved because of his grace. And if you want further proof, if you want further proof that they are sinners too, proning to sin unless God saves them and preserves them, what did Noah's son Canaan do right afterwards when Noah got drunk and Canaan exposed the nakedness of his father, sinning to such a great extent that Noah then cursed, I'm sorry, Ham, I'm thinking Canaan. What did Ham, Noah's son, do when his father got 
drunk, Ham exposed his father's nakedness, bringing such judgment that Noah cursed Canaan. No, not homosexuality, Riaz. You're misreading it, reading too much into it. If you read Genesis 9 carefully, no, it's not even gossip. The careful reading of Genesis 9, you have to understand something about Scripture. And God willing, I'll unpack this in a future session. I already did it years ago. If you read Genesis 9 carefully, where it says, and Ham exposed his father's nakedness. Go to Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20. Exposing your father's nakedness is to sleep with his wife. Exposing the father's nakedness is to sleep with his wife. It's not to sleep with your father. You with me? I want you to understand something about Scripture. Scripture often telescopes historical narrative, historical events. Pay attention. I need your attention here. 1611, I'm going to prove it to you. Just pay attention. When you get a chance tonight, read Genesis 9, then read Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20. Genesis 9 says, Ham exposed his father's nakedness, but his brothers came in backward and covered his father's nakedness. Read Leviticus 18 and 20. Exposing your father's nakedness means to sleep with your father's wife. That's number one. Number two. Oftentimes in the Bible, the writers will telescope historical events. In other words, things that took a period of time to unfold, they will telescope it as if it all happened at that moment. Thank you, Riaz. This is why Noah cursed Canaan, because the implication is Canaan was the bastard child of that unlawful union between Ham and his mother. Ever wondered why he didn't curse Ham, but he cursed Canaan? Ever wonder why? Because the implication is Ham got his mother pregnant. She gave birth to the bastard son, okay, Canaan. And is it a coincidence that the Canaanites followed the pattern of their ancestor in that one of the sins that God commends the, condemns the Canaanites for is incest, sleeping with their mothers or sleeping with their daughters? Yep, the first to sin, king of kings. Don't take my word for it. Don't take my word for it. And don't blindly follow the traditions of men. Read Genesis 9, King James Version. Ham exposed his father's nakedness. Go to Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20. Go and I challenge you. Prove to me that exposing your father's nakedness does not mean, in the context of the Pentateuch, sleeping with your father's wife even if she happens to be your mother. Incest. Don't take my word for it. And exegetically, contextually, you can't refute it. I'm being honest. This is the interpretation of Scripture. Thank you, guys. Thank you, brother. So you've studied. You see I'm not making it up. No, dog man. Because what you saw was two dogs in the shower. Send dogmen on his merry way. Choose Jesus. Not only were they doing it back then, they're doing it today. Read Leviticus 18 and 20. Don't ask me where. Read. I just gave you homework. Read the entire chapters. What's wrong with you? H-G-G-F-H-H. Stuck for a lot of blood, I mean. They do it to this day, man. In fact, choose Jesus. When you read Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20... God mentions a list of sins that the Canaanites were engaged in that God warned Israel about because he says, I'm destroying the Canaanites for these sins. Don't commit those sins. One of the sins is sleeping with animals, bestiality, offering your son as a sacrifice to the god Molech, and incest. Okay? So notice how beautiful the Bible is. 
The Bible uses not so much coded language, but euphemism, guarded language. Choose Jesus. Read Leviticus 18 and 20 tonight. Don't, don't take my word for it. The Bible uses guarded language in order to try to describe this incestuous relationship between him and his mother in an honorable manner as to not disgrace Noah. Right? You see how guarded it is? Ham exposed his father's nakedness. So the author of Genesis then expects you to continue reading the rest of the books to know what that means because he tells you what it means in Leviticus 18 and 20. You catch it? So you see the beautiful way God describes this wicked, evil sin of Ham. He exposed his father's nakedness. Okay, what does that mean? Then the astute reader, the attentive reader who's reading, because Moses wrote the five books, right? That's what we believe. When they get to Leviticus 18 and they read, do not expose your father's nakedness and sleep with his, uh, with his wife. Bam, whoa, whoa, wait, wait. I just read that somewhere. Hey, I read that in Genesis 9. I read Noah expo uh, Ham exposed Noah's nakedness. But wait, Leviticus 18 and in chapter 20, exposing your father's nakedness is to sleep with his wife. Are you telling me Ham slept with his mother? And are you telling me that the Bible, without coming out and saying it in order to honor Noah, the servant of God, implies that Canaan is the result of that incestuous relation, which now makes sense why Noah is cursing Canaan? Everyone wonder why he's cursing Canaan? Why not curse Ham? Isn't it a sad thing that we don't have this taught in churches? There are solid churches that teach this, but we don't have many of them. Well, there, covering it means... That Noah being in a drunken stupor, and after Ham had ravished his wife, covering it means <clears throat> there that you would take it in the sense that they came and tried to honor their mother. How do I say this? What? How do I say? In other words, you would take it as they're trying to honor and cover over the sin of what just happened. Right? You get it, Roland? Instead of then doing what he did, they try to honor their mother and then try to cover up that sin because of what happened. Right? In fact, here, let me do this, man. Because you guys are all you guys are a bunch of skeptics. You wicked skeptics here. Hold on, man. Okay. You guys are making me upset, then I'm gonna hurt you guys. Okay, hold on. Sorry. Because you know how you are. Leviticus 18, 8. You shall not have relations with your father's wife, for this exposes your father's nakedness. <whistles> Leviticus 18, 10. You shall not have relation with your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter, for this exposes your own nakedness. <whistles> okay? Leviticus 18, 14. You shall not expose the nakedness of your father's brother, you shall not approach his wife for relations. She is your aunt. Is Are you getting it now? That the exposing nakedness means to have sexual relations? Do I need to give you more? Do I need to give you more? You see what exposing nakedness means? Having sexual relations. Don't ask me that question here, Ricky. Come on, man. What kind of question is this? You want me to answer that in 10 seconds? Talking to the guy that his ex-wife did the same thing. Now she's living in misery and hell. Brother, I can't answer that in 10 seconds. I got to know the background. You mean me and ont ont ontologics? Just by remembering 
phrases and expressions and tying them in. That doesn't mean I haven't learned from other men of God. Of course I have. And to logic, that's why you got to get a good translation that translates accurately so you can recall these phrases and expressions. You get into logics? Because if you're reading Genesis carefully, into logics, you should you would have put in your mind, Ham exposed his father's nakedness. Okay. Then when you get to Leviticus 18, it says, Do not expose your father's nakedness and sleep with his wife. Whoa, whoa. Man, that sounds familiar. Hey, that's Genesis 9. You get it now? That's why you got to get a good translation, folks, that doesn't paraphrase. Here's where you need translations that don't paraphrase, but retain the idioms, the expressions, the euphemisms. Exposing one's nakedness is a euphemism for having sex. You get it now? Yep, modern English. And that's what I was reading, Rebel Mark. I was reading from the modern English version. Did you catch it all throughout Leviticus 18? Exposing one's nakedness has to do with sexual intercourse, illegal, immoral sexual relations. You caught it now? I know we took a lot of time on this one issue. So read Leviticus chapter 18, read Leviticus chapter 20 with Genesis 9. You're going to see it. Okay, now coming back to the issue. Yep, it can mean that too, guy. Certain places, stones is simply, <laughs> yeah, for the, yeah, because the Bible at times is going to use guarded language, coded language, and sometimes it'll just be right in your face. I have no idea what that has to do with my topic. Okay. Right. You want me there? Everyone clear on that one? Okay. What was the point? Because you guys got shocked at this. Let me repeat the point. What was the point? When God saw and smelled the aroma of the burnt offerings in Genesis 8, 20, 21, and God said, on the basis of the burnt offerings, I won't destroy man, even though the intentions of his heart are evil from childhood. He was talking about Noah and his family, proving Noah and his family, they too were sinners at heart, who had it not been for the grace of God, they too would have deserved to be destroyed. You, you with me there? You with me there? And what's the proof they too are sinners at heart? The sin of Ham, the drunkenness of Noah. Now, you can excuse Noah because you could say, well, he really didn't know the effects, the intoxicating effects of the vineyard because he just learned it as he went along, right? And therefore, he can't be culpable of that sin because he didn't know he was going to get drunk from the vine. You with me there? Clear with me? Clear everyone? You understanding what's going on? So you can excuse Noah's drunkenness and that he got drunk out of ignorance. He didn't know any better, right? Right. He just took some vintage from the vineyard, the vine, drank, and he got drunk. But Ham then took that as an opportunity to jump on his mother. And then the implication is that she got pregnant, waited to give birth, even though the narrative telescopes it, makes it seem like it all happened at one that same day. No, didn't happen the same day. Period of time elapsed, but it's condensed because the author doesn't want to waste time going into detail. He doesn't want to waste time on something so horrendous and wicked and shameful. He just wants to cut to the chase and get to the point. So he telescopes it. This is what happened. Canaan is born. Noah curses Canaan. Now it makes more sense, doesn't it? Because you ever wonder why is he cursing Canaan? So it's not homosexuality. Some people say the exposing anger, meaning that's a euphemism for him having sex with his dad. No, 
It's not homosexuality. Exposing nakedness in Leviticus 18.20 is to sleep with someone's woman, right? In this case, your father's wife. So does that point sink in? Well, whether he knew or not, you can make a case he didn't, and he simply discovered the intoxicating effects of divine at that moment, and then excuse him of being culpable of sin. That's what I'm saying, guy. That's why I didn't want to get into an argument and say he sinned, because I know what the naysayer is going to say. No, you can't condemn him. He didn't know. So I don't want, you get my point, guy? Why I said you can excuse it, that he wasn't culpable? Because I don't want someone to say, no, brother, you can't condemn him for sin. He didn't know. I got, yeah, All right, all right. I don't want to go there. Okay, that's something we don't need to fight over. But what you can't deny is that the language of exposing someone's nakedness in the light of the Pentateuch. Remember, same Moses who wrote Genesis wrote Leviticus 18 and 20. Same Moses who told us that Noah knew about burnt offerings later on prescribes burnt offerings in the book of Le Leviticus. Right? Sorry, my nose is stuffy now. Right? You catch it? So how are you going to now deny that nakedness in Genesis 9 means Ham slept with his father's wife when the same author later on tells you what that expression means? And who cares what you thought? Some of us think that you're just mentally challenged. Now, do you accept that, Andrew? I don't think so. Whether you th Moses wrote it or not, it's still the same source, Pentateuchal. Pentateuchal. Okay, you with me there? And you thought wrong, Andrew. Stop listening to liberal critical scholarship and listen to the conservative scholars provide the internal historical archaeological proof showing documentary hypothesis is a figment of their imagination. But that's another topic. Even if you take the documentary hypothesis, you're still stuck with the fact that this is found in the Pentateuchal sources, Pentateuch. It's there, whoever wrote it. You with me there? No, I just want to make sure. I'm taking my time. Andrew, since you read it, you know we're going to send you on your merry way. We're going to give you a one-way ticket to Tripoli. When a moon hits your eye, it's like a pizza pie that's some more. Biddy, biddy, me, biddy, biddy, be. All right. If that's clear, can we go back to the point? Can we go back to the point? Okay, Andrew. Can we go back to the point? Now that you the shock factor has worn off, you're shocked now, you're back to normal. Breathe. Mellow, mellow. Think of a happy plate. Think of a happy plate. Okay. For all back. For all back. Going back to Genesis 8, 2021. 20, Do you understand now? God was speaking of Noah and his family when he said, Though, though. The intentions of the thoughts of the heart of man is evil from childhood. I will not destroy all mankind. He was speaking of Noah and his seven family members because they're the only mankind at that time when God said it. Though obviously he has future generations in mind, that statement has an immediate application to Noah and his family. And proof that it's referring to Noah and his family, the very next chapter we see the kind of sins they committed. Why am I... Highlighting that because that affirms and proves Noah was not saved because of his righteousness, contrary to what anyone will tell you. If you want clear-cut proof that God did not save Noah and his family because they were righteous, but because of his grace and mercy, here you go, proving that God has saved people from the very start on the basis of his love, his grace, and mercy, not because they had to live up to a standard before he would show them mercy.
And here, let me what your appetite for a future session. That's a different context. That's completely different. And I don't have time to talk about the nakedness of Adam and Eve. Different context. Here, let me show you something to what your appetite in the future. Okay. Genesis 6, verses 8 to 9. Genesis 6, verses 8 to 9. Now, I'm going to really shock you. And the Dead Sea Scrolls furnish evidence for this interpretation, so you don't think I made it up. Okay. Genesis 6, 8 to 9. But Noah found grace in the eyes of Jehovah. Notice what comes first. Guys, pay attention. Don't be distracted. Grace comes first, then the declaration that Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. What came first, Noah walking with God or God's grace upon Noah that resulted in Noah being just before God and walking with him? What comes first in that order? What comes first in that order? Here, I'm going to shock you guys now. Yep, grace leads to perfection. Amen. Amen. Notice it was the grace that Noah found, because God bestowed it on him, that resulted in Noah being just before God and walking with God because God graced him to do that. Yep, Noah, of course, recognized it. But now, let me show you something that's going to blow you away. You ready? I don't have time to unpack this. The Dead Sea Scrolls, the Genesis Apocryphon. Don't take my word for it. Genesis Apocryphon, Aramaic paraphrase of Genesis, will confirm what I'm about to tell you. Guys, can you remember Genesis Apocryphon, Apocryphon in the Dead Sea Scrolls? An Aramaic scroll of Genesis written before the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone with me? Everyone with me? But that desiring God was the result of God moving him to desire God. Okay, here, let me spell it. Okay, Genesis, sorry. Genesis, Apocrypha. You can, I think it's even available online. Okay. Dead Sea Scrolls, right before the time of Christ. So Dead Sea Scrolls, it may be online. Okay, now, let's go to Genesis 6, 9, read it again. Genesis 6, 9. These are the generations of Noah. Generations. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. Now, don't take my word for it. Look up the Hebrew words and look at any lexical source. Perfect in his generations can also mean perfect in his genealogy, meaning that his line wasn't tainted by the sons of God, which was one of the reasons why his line is preserved, because his line hadn't been contaminated by the sons of God, so God was preserving a pure genealogy, not contaminated by the sons of God. Did you know that? And you find the Jews even understanding the Hebrew phrase in that way. Because in the Genesis Apocryphon, you'll find Noah's father. Does anyone remember what Noah's father's name was? Does anyone remember what Noah's father's name was in Genesis 5? Let's see. Come on, man. It's right there. Look it up. Lemech. In the Genesis Apocryphon, Lemech asks his wife when she's pregnant with Noah, did you get pregnant by one of the watchers? And she assures him, no, I didn't. This is your seed. Did you know that? So in this highly interpretive version of Genesis, they have Lemech telling his wife when she's pregnant, are you a child with the watchers, the sons of God, the Nephilim? Did you get pregnant by them? And she has to assure him, no, 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 it's your seed, it's your son. That's how contaminated the earth had become that even someone like Lemech is thinking twice and has to question, hey, ho, oh, hey, wait, sweetie, you sure that's my kid? Or did you get knocked up by one of the watchers? Yeah, not making it up. 
So perfect in his generations can mean his genealogy, his line was perfect because God preserved his line from being contaminated. So one of the favors that God bestowed on Noah was to make sure that Noah's genealogy was not contaminated, a work of God's grace. God, by his grace, worked it out that this line culminating in Noah was free of contamination. What place? This place makes me sick sometimes. What place, Susan? What are you talking about? Oh, okay. I thought me. I'm like, what did I do to you? I thought you loved me. Yeah, it should make you sick. It should make you hate this world, the things of the world, and ache for Jesus and love Jesus and want heaven even more and Jesus to return. So do you see one of the blessings of God bestowing grace upon Noah? Okay. One of the blessings, when it says Noah found favor with God in the context, you know what that means? It means two things. Can I unpack it? Two things. Not only did God in his grace and mercy spare Noah, even though he was no better, but God in his mercy spared his line from being corrupted and contaminated by the sons of God. So the grace of God was such that he preserved Noah's descent, his genealogy, keeping it pure from being contaminated by the sons of God in order to have a pure line culminating in the Messiah. In other words, this, is what, this was an evil demonic attempt of contaminating the human race in order to prevent the Messiah to come. You with me there? Yep. The evidence shows the watchers were spirit creatures. Making sense? Do you see how much meat is in our Bible? How amazing our Bible is? How mind-blowing our Bible is? How supernatural, divine our Bible is? If we ask the Holy Spirit, remove the veil from my eyes, help me to see wonders in this book that you produced, and blow my mind away with the beauty of your word to strengthen my heart that you are God revealed in this book. Everything good is from the triumph God, Tracy. So thank him for this blessing upon my life. Okay? Yep, the book of Enoch goes into detail. Okay, now, now notice Iriata is going to get into side conversations. He just came in here. Yep. But also, Nada, the perfection of Noah was also in respect to his physical physical genealogy because he hadn't been contaminated by the watchers. Everyone there? Now let's go back to Genesis 8, 20, 21, because I'm going to wrap things up with Jesus being the tabernacle of God. Yep, Peter and Jude confirm it's the, the angels. The sons of God are angels. Uh, well, people say that the Bible contradicts itself. It's neither here nor there. Genesis 8, 20 to 21. But Noah built an altar unto Jehovah and took of every clean beast. Guys, pay attention now. Pay attention. Genesis 8, 20 to 21. And Noah built an altar unto Jehovah and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And Jehovah smelt a sweet savior. And Jehovah said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite anymore every thing living as I have done. Now, guys. Did you see that long before the law of Moses, guys, I need your ears now. Long before the law of Moses, Noah already knew of the necessity to build an altar to offer sacrifices of clean animals and birds, birds to offer a burnt offering to appease God so God isn't wrathful and destroys mankind. Noah knew this. Long before it was revealed to Moses. Right? 
This is long before God prescribed the sacrificial system, the priesthood, and the temple through Moses. Did you catch it? No one knew this because God told him. That's why when you read the flood story, it says that Noah brought clean and unclean animals upon the ark. Clean animals for sacrifice. In other words, what you also learn is that God had already revealed to Noah clean and unclean animals that later would be unpacked by Moses in Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14. In other words, God revealed to Moses kashrut, what we call kosher. He revealed to him, these are clean animals and clean birds. These are unclean animals and unclean birds. You offer me only clean animals and clean birds. So long before Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14, long before God had already given a list of clean animals versus unclean animals, clean birds versus unclean birds, God had already revealed that to Noah. But with one difference, folks. Noah was allowed to eat anything, but at the time of Moses, they were allowed to only eat the clean animals and birds. The only reason why Noah was told what clean animals and birds were was for the purpose of offering the right sacrifices to appease God. You with me there? Long before Moses, first and last, Noah already knew clean birds and animals versus unclean birds and animals. The only difference between Noah and Moses is that Moses' time, Israelites could only eat the clean birds and animals, whereas Noah could eat anything and everything. There were no restrictions on him. But the only restriction is don't eat anything with blood in it. That was it. Don't eat anything with blood, but you can eat anything. So the purpose of revealing to Noah clean birds and clean animals was for the purpose of giving to God the right sacrifices to appease him. You with me there? Is that making sense, everyone? So did you catch why God swore that he would never destroy the earth? Uh, by flood, if you continue reading, it means by flood. Not that he wouldn't destroy the earth, but he wouldn't destroy it by flood water. It's because it says when he smelled the sweet aroma of the burnt offerings, right? When the aroma of the burnt offerings reached God's nostrils, metaphorically speaking, when he smelled the sweet aroma, it appeased his heart. And he said, because of this, I won't destroy all flesh by water. Right? So what moved God to make that oath that he won't destroy mankind by water again? Because if you continue reading, it's by water. He won't destroy mankind again. The burnt offerings, the smell of the burnt offerings, right? Yep, don't eat anything with the lifeblood in it. How does this tie in with the Lord Jesus Christ? Ephesians 5, verse 2. Ephesians 5, verse 2. How does this tie in with the Lord Jesus Christ? How do burnt offerings tie in with the Lord Jesus Christ? And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. Bam! Jesus is the sweet-smelling aroma and Savior that when God smells, it delights his heart so that God will never destroy any man who accepts that sweet-smelling Savior by faith in Jesus. Didn't I tell you everything points to the Lord Jesus Christ? Didn't I tell you not Savior, Savior, Savor, not Savior. Come on, DHS, I'm about to lay hands on you. Something that's savory, tasty, waters your mouth. Didn't I tell you everything points to the Lord Jesus Christ? And by the way, not only did no one know about the necessity of offering sacrifices to appease God, okay, 
Abraham knew about the necessity of offering sacrifices to appease God, and so did Job long before Moses. Let me repeat this again. Long before Moses, Noah, Abraham, and Job knew of the necessity of offering the right sacrifices to appease God. Okay? Let's go to Genesis 22, verse 2. Genesis 22, verse 2. Some believe he was. Some say he was after. I don't know. That's a debate. Some say he was actually an Edomite. I don't know. Genesis 22, 2. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Guys, did you catch it? God doesn't need to explain to Abraham what a burnt offering is. He assumes Abraham already knows. I want you to offer your son as a burnt offering. Doesn't explain what a burnt offering was because they knew already what a burnt offering was. Right? Job 1, 4 to 5. Job 1, verses 4 to 5. Thank you, Jordan. Job 1, 4 to 5. Almost done, folks. I hope you can hang with me because, Lord willing, I won't be able to be with you till the end of the weekend. Job 1, 4 to 5. Job's sons are celebrating birthdays. So there's a biblical basis for birthdays. Here it is. Biblical basis for birthdays. But watch this. Job 1, verses 4 to 5. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, meaning birthday, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them. Now notice what Job does. And it was so that when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For God said, for Job said, I'm sorry, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. <clears throat> Thus did Job continually. Thus did Job continually. Did you catch it? Job knew enough to offer burnt offerings to atone for the sins of his children in case they got a little wild and out of hand when they celebrated their birthdays. Did you catch it? So he knew about burnt offerings, and he knew God required sacrifices to cover sin. He didn't need Moses to tell him. But then it gets better. Job 42, verses 7 to 10. Job 42, verses 7 to 10. God is angry with Job's three unwise friends as Job was angry with them. God is angry with Job's three unwise friends as Job was angry with them. Now notice what God tells Job to do. Job 42, 7 to 10. Guys, pay attention. Let's unpack this meat. So I need your attention. And it was so that after the, the Lord Jehovah had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord Jehovah said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends. <clears throat> For ye have not spoken to me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. Therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams. Go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. Hmm. And my servant Job shall pray for you. For him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, lest I punish you because of your stupidity, and that you have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. So Eliphaz the Timonite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Namathite went and did according as Jehovah commanded them. The Lord Jehovah also accepted Job, and Jehovah turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also jo the Jehovah gave Job twice as much as he had before. Let's unpack the meat. Let's unpack the meat. God says, I require burnt offerings to appease my wrath for your sins. Otherwise, I'm going to consume you in my wrath for your sins. So here you're seeing the repeated pattern in the Hebrew Bible, contrary to these wicked anti-Christian rabbis like Tobia Singer, the necessity of sincere repentance, faith, and sacrifice to atone for sin. Right? You see that? Number one. But now notice how God works. Notice how God works. God is speaking to them directly. The assumption is they're seeing God in the world and hearing his voice audibly. And God, notice what he didn't do. He didn't say, simply pray to me and offer it to me directly and I'll forgive you. He demands a mediator. You can't do it. 
Job has to do it for you. And when he does it, I'll accept it on your behalf. So here you see that God requires mediation, an intercessor. He's talking to them directly. So why don't you just say, God, God, why don't you just tell them, hey, pray to me directly and offer it. I'll take it. No, 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 no. Job is going to do it, and I'll accept it from him on your behalf. So here it is not true that God doesn't require a mediator intercessor. Of course he does. But in Christ, we have the best of both worlds. We have God who became man to be our intercessor. Right? Do you see that role in everyone else? Do you see? Why not just say, you pray to me and offer the sacrifices to me? No, Job has to do it. Job will be your mediator, your intercessor. He will then offer the sacrifices, and I will accept it from him for your sake. The Father accepts Jesus' prayers and sacrifice on our behalf for Jesus' sake. But then I want you to catch the third thing, third thing that you missed. I want you to catch the third thing that you missed. Verse 10 again. We're almost done, folks. I don't know if Al is still here is listening. A lot of meat today, huh? And Jehovah turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. I don't know if you caught it. It says, when Job prayed, that's when God set Job free and blessed him <clears throat> twice as much as before. It was when Job prayed for his friends that God blessed him. Why? Does anyone see the, the, the deeper spiritual implication there? Does anyone see the implication here? Let's see who caught it. Why wasn't it until he prayed for them that God released them and blessed them doubly? Yes. Uh, nothing, abiding on nothing. I wouldn't know what you're talking about. Yes, not only because mediator, but think about it. Think about the implication. God wasn't simply trying to bless and forgive Job's friends. God was also working on Job's heart because Job was angry and disgusted with his friends. So by praying for them, God would use Job's prayer to heal his heart and forgive them and love them. After all, he couldn't pray sincerely for them if he hated them. He was using this to heal his heart of any unforgiveness. Did you catch it? Because you're not going to pray sincerely for someone you hate. So God is using the prayer to heal Job, Job's heart, to forgive them and let go. Because for that prayer to be accepted, God, it has to be from Job's heart pleading, Oh God, please, please forgive them. Please, Lord. You see what's happening here? And you won't pray for someone sincerely to be forgiven if you don't love them and forgive them. You with me there? I'm going to do a part two of this, but I'm going to give you the cliff notes. I'll go more in depth later, but I'm going to give you now part two of this. Yes. Notice it says, when he prayed, God released him from his captivity. Not just his captivity to, to his disease, but his captivity to the hate he must, he must have felt for the way they were condemning him. He had been taken captive by his anger and his emotions. And by praying for them, God was healing his heart. So here is a lesson for every one of us, something that I need to practice. I need to practice by the power of the Holy Spirit, not give lip service. So I beg the Holy Spirit, give me the power to practice this, not to be a hypocrite, to practice this. Please, Holy Spirit, I am a hypocrite, save me. 
Do you want to forgive someone who has hurt you and done you wrong and you have hate? Pray from your heart that God will forgive them. Do you know why I noticed it? Because that's my struggle with my ex-wife. What she did to my children and destroying my family and putting us in this debt and having a judge trying to destroy me, it is easy for me to hate her and despise her and wish hell and damnation on her. But you know how I can be released? Truly praying, God have mercy on her and forgive her. And the more I do that, the more I will be healed and be free of this bondage to this hate and destruction on her life. Do you get my point? So don't see it as simply a blessing for the person hurt you. See it as a blessing for you to heal you because you cannot generally pray forgiveness from someone with God accepting it if it's not from a heart that truly desires forgiveness for that individual. You see? Right? We all do, Rebel Mark. That's why I please beg Jesus to give me the power to practice what I preach perfectly because I'm a hypocrite. May Jesus save me from that. It's going to be hard, Ricky, especially you. Your trials and, and anger and anguish are just beginning, my friend. You've seen nothing yet, Ricky. I've lived through the courts through two years, and the courts hate men and want to destroy men because it's a satanic attack on men as the head of the household, the feminization of men, and the masculinization of women. Because what God wants, Satan seeks to destroy. Right? Okay. Now, let's end it with, let's end it with, the tabernacle of God. Jesus is the tabernacle of God. You guys may not know this. Let's go to Exodus 40, 34 to 38. Exodus 40, 34 to 38. In all our hearts, idiot, not only you. That's why I pray for me, to truly pray from my heart for her forgiveness. So I can be free. It's more healing for me than it is for her. Okay. Exodus 40, 34 to 35. Guys. Read with me. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation. I want you to remember the word tent. Tent of congregation. And the glory of Jehovah filled the tabernacle. So notice glory. Tent, glory. Glory filled the tent, the tabernacle. Pay attention. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of Jehovah filled the tabernacle. Okay, pay attention where we're going to go with this. Okay, you guys got to pay attention because you're going to be blown away. Some of you know this already. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. Now, 38. For the cloud of Jehovah was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night. In the sight of all those... In the sight of all those of the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Sight of all of Israel. Okay, pay attention. Tent of meeting, which is the tabernacle. The cloud of Jehovah filled the tent, which was a sign of God filling the tent with glory. Filling the tent with glory, right? That visible cloud, which appeared as fire by night, was... The visible manifestation of God's presence with his people. They knew when the cloud came down, God was in that cloud. And the cloud filled it, filled the tent. Okay. The, in the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the word tent, tent is skene. 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 Okay. The Greek translation of the word tent is skene. Everyone with me there? Skene. Let's read John 1, 14, and first, last, post the Greek. Job, yes, Job, you mean. Not Job, Job. Okay, but no, not Exodus 40, 34. Oh, you posted it anyway? Yeah, there you go. It's the Skenan. 
to Marturio. Ten skinen to Marturio. Okay. Post the Greek of John 1.14. Guys, pay attention. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. See, you won't catch it. You know that word, dwelt among us? It's right there in the Greek. It's es kino sin. Es kino sin. It comes from skinao. This is the verbal form of skine. Literally, what eskinosin means is that when the word became flesh, his physical body became the tent, the tabernacle that was filled with the glory of the Father. In other words, what John just told you is Jesus' physical body is the true abiding tent tabernacle that houses the fullness of the glory of God. So you don't need to go to the temple in Jerusalem anymore because Jesus' physical body is now the tent, the tabernacle, the temple, the true temple that's now immortal, indestructible because God raised it that is filled with the glory of God and the fullness of deity. That's what John 1.14 just told you. And in case you don't believe me, John 2, 19 to 22. John 2, 19 to 22. John 2, 19 to 22. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Notice, temple. Hmm, what temple, Jesus? Then said the Jews, Forty-six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou, you, rear it up in three days? But the, But he spake of the temple of his body. Bam! He just said, my physical body is the temple that you'll destroy, but I'll raise it up in three days. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word what Jesus had said. Do you guys catch it? When Jesus became flesh, he pitched his tent, tabernacled among us, and when he did, we saw the glory of the Father filling him. Because the word dwelt among us in Greek, eskinosin, is from skinao, which comes from skine and means pitched his tent, tabernacle, made his tabernacle, his tent with us. And that's why Jesus says this physical body, this physical body is the temple of God. You're going to destroy it. But I'm going to raise this temple and make it indestructible and immortal. My physical body is the true tent where all the fullness of God, all the fullness of his glory dwells. Did you catch it? You see why John 1.14 connects, dwelt among us and we've seen his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth? You see the language of John? Now, what came down on the tent, the tabernacle in the Old Testament? Do you remember what came down? What came down on the tent, the tabernacle in the Old Testament? What came down? Remember what came down, Exodus 40, 34, 38? What came down on it and filled it? The cloud, right? Cloud. Matthew 17, 5. Matthew 17, 5. Matthew 17, verse 5. Matthew 17, 5. Watch here, Roland. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. <whistles> just like the cloud came down on the tent, the tabernacle, and filled it. Just like it came down in the temple of Solomon and filled it with the glory of Jehovah. Here's Jesus in his physical body, the living physical tent and temple of God. And the cloud comes down on him. So, what does it point to Jesus in the Hebrew Bible? The sacrifices, the priesthood, the temple, the tent. 
the story of Noah, the story of Job, the story of Abraham. What doesn't point to Jesus? What doesn't point to him? Okay. With that said, Lord Jesus willing, tomorrow in the morning, I say bye-bye to my home. Chicago, Chicago has been basically my, my birthplace because I came to Chicago when I was two years old, 1974. I'm now leaving the city that I was raised in the city that Jesus revealed himself to me, the city that the Lord Jesus used to mold me and shape me for his glory, I'm leaving it behind. And in this city, I leave the two greatest treasures that my God has given me after the treasure of knowing him. The only being I love more is my God, Father, Son, and Spirit, though I love him perfectly. But I have to leave behind my very heart, my two beautiful girls, my nine-year-old and my seven-year-old for now, Sariah and Zipporah. Sariah means princess of Jehovah, princess of Jesus, and Zipporah is the name of Moses' wife. I have to, by faith, go to a strange land, by faith, settle there, and by faith, believe and have no doubt. God is already there before me, and he's already pre preparing miracles and blessings to use me to glorify him, and he will provide for me to stand on my feet, provide for me so that I can have my girls and that he'll bring them safe, not harmed by the one as they're covered by the blood of Jesus and help me to continue to get healthier and holier for the Lord. And if God is pleased, even provide this time if he wants a godly companion to help me expand the kingdom. But it's hard. It's hard. So I drive tomorrow, and Lord willing, I'll be there the latest Saturday. So you won't hear from me until the weekend, Sunday at the earliest perhaps, or Monday. So I need your prayers. I need your fasting. Fast and pray and have your churches fast and pray. This is a major change in my life. Beg God to destroy this wicked, evil decision of this judge, to rebuke, chasten this job, judge, this dog, to keep her away from me and her lawyers, and preserve the money he's given me to get on my feet. So I'm leaving. So Lord willing, subscribe. Watch all these videos, not just the recent ones. Go back. I've been doing this for two years. Watch them over and over again. Take notes. Download them. Take clips. <clears throat> Use this information and pray. The Lord Jesus will make me holier, more disciplined, more pure, more in love with him, more worshipful, healthier, provide financially. Protect my girls, provide for them, save us and bring us together and pray for their mother to be convicted and repent. Pray for one another to grow in love with Jesus, to love each other more, to serve Jesus more faithfully and pray for Andrew. Though he says he's an atheist at heart, he's really a Christian. Pray he'll be sold out for Jesus again. So I'll see you over the weekend and pray for my throat that by the time I wake up in the morning, in his mercy, I'll be perfectly fit and healthy enough to drive and pray for my brother, Salim. Sal, who I leave behind, that God will preserve him and provide for him until he is reunited with me in another land. This is their names. My angels. Christ is dying. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Bless us. Preserve us. Protect us. Transform us. And provide for our needs and save us from our trials and save the persecuted church and fight for the persecuted church and arise for the persecuted church and convict hearts to repent. And bless Andrew to come and fall in love with Jesus again. And please watch over my daughters. You love them more than I can imagine. And my hope and my trust is in you. We love you, Abba. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Take care, guys. Christ is risen, risen indeed.